All right, Shabbat Shalom. Uh, do this over again. Yeah. Uh, your brother Azrael with another Sabbath lesson from the hopeful elect, brother Donna. Um, today's lesson is going to be titled Blood Bot. Right? We're going to go into the blood, right? The blood of who? Right? What blood symbolizes? And it's going to be a twist at the end. So you got to stay with me, right? Because it's going to be a twist at the end. First verse we go into is Leviticus 17 and 14. This is the book of Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 14. For it is the life of all flesh. The blood of it is, is, is for the life thereof. Therefore, I said unto the children of Israel, ye shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh. For the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Whosoever eateth it shall be cut off. Start from you shall again. Ye shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh, for the life of the, all the flesh is the blood there, thereof. Whosoever eateth it shall be cut off. Right, so this right here is telling us what? Don't be cannibals. Don't eat each other, right? And it also was telling us don't eat anything with blood in it. So they had different techniques on how to drain blood from animals. They wasn't eating stuff that was, uh, you know what I'm saying, not well done or not well cooked. You know what I'm saying? Had no pink in it. Everything was cooked thoroughly and drained with different arteries and veins, right? Thoroughly. Because the life was in the blood. So if you had any bit of blood in there, there was life in there. All right. So um, <clears throat> with that being said, let's go to John chapter 6 and verse 55. This is the book of John chapter 6 and verse 55. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. Right, so here, a lot of people would like to tell you that, that the Bible's contradicting itself, and that Christ or Jesus is trying to tell us that we're, we're supposed to eat him. And they'll say, you know, the Old Testament says there's no cannibal, cannibalism is illegal, but Christ is saying to eat him. Why is this contradicting, right? Or you might have some Old Testament only people to say that as well. But... That's not what he's talking about, right? What is this blood? Read that one more time. Verse 55. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. Right. What does that mean? Let's get a deeper, deeper understanding before we go into it, right? Let's go to Matthew 26 and 28. The book of Matthew chapter 26 and verse 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remissions of sins. Right. This is his blood of the New Testament. That's what? Shed for many, which is the remission of sins. It's the remission of sins. All right. So how in the Old Testament, right, in the law, how do you get um, remission for sins? How do you get that? The New Testament will tell you how you get remissions of sins in the Old Testament, right? Because they all go together. So let's get that, right? Hebrews 9 and 22. So what does he mean by drink his blood, eat his meat, right? His flesh is good for meat. What does he mean by these things, right? You got this, it? This is the book of Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Purged with what? Purged with blood. So almost all things are cleaned with blood. Now that sounds kind of filthy. That's not what it means. To be purged with blood means to purify it, all right? Because why? There's life in blood. So guess what? If you want something to have life, you, gotta, you have to purify it with blood. Keep reading. And without shedding of blood is no remission. So all Christ was trying to tell you here in a parabolic or allegorical way is that, hey, look, I'm y'all sacrifice. All he was trying to tell them was, Hey, look, man, I am the remission of y'all sins. I know back in the day we used to kill animals and stuff, but I've been called to be a sacrifice for y'all, right? Because it was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 57, I believe, right? Isaiah chapter 57, I believe it's prophesied that what? That Christ would bear the sins of many, right? So they can't say that, you know, a man can't die for the nation because it was prophesied that a man would come and die for the nation. And he's saying, guess what? I'm that man. He's saying, my blood, right? You need a, that's your drink offering, right? My meat, right? My flesh, that's your meat offering. It's lucky too. Also, 
all throughout the um the Old Testament and the New Testament, we see um uh, phrases uh, paraphrasing um phraseology phraseology that that sounds like uh or take of this cup or or drink of this cup, right? And it's also um closely related to judgments and whatnot, right? And so there's there's a cup that's set before everybody and everybody has a cup and everybody's going to drink it. What Christ is uh, simply saying is for the children of Israel, right? He was going to be that cup for them. Right. And so on a deeper meaning, when you see um, when, when Christ said, hey, look, go into so and so's house and go upstairs where we'll have the Last Supper, what the world calls the Last Supper or communion, which was really the Passover. He said, I want to celebrate the Passover with y'all. So when he was giving this speech, it was the Passover. So they're all at a table, right? They're not cannibals, but Christ is saying, guess what? Here, pass this cup along. Why? Because he prophesied to Paul, he prophesied to Peter that all of them, they would die for the truth too. And they did, right? So he's saying, guess what? Just like the brother just brought out when he passed that cup around, hey, look, are you worthy? First of all, are you worthy to even get the cup passed to you? And also, Will you be able to withstand the persecution that, that that comes with that cup, right? Because Christ, you know what I'm saying? If Christ had that cup and he's giving it to you, guess what? You got to, we're not above our master. We're going to have to endure everything that he endured. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's what that, that cup being passed is. And also deeper meaning, we'll get into that later. We'll get into that later. So lucky if I may add too, right? Right. Like I, I had previously, previously said, man, there's a, we all have a, a cup of judgment you know what I'm saying? That's set before us. And what Christ is saying is, hey, look, take my cup instead, right? Just like he said, um, take my yoke for my, my burden is uh, light, right? Paraphrasing roughly. He's the same thing with this cup, right? He's, he's literally telling, hey, take my cup so you don't have to take your cup, right? Because your cup, you might not get remissions of sins, right? You might not have an advocate with the Father, right? You might have to face everything that you've, uh, every sin that you committed, right? And it's gonna be held against you, right? He's, he's letting you know, hey, look, take my cup, but you also gotta be worthy to take it. You know what I'm saying? Because it comes with um, responsibilities, right? With 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 more, um, with more pleasures, always comes with more responsibilities, right? right. Which, with with a, higher, uh, a higher status always comes with responsibilities. If you get promoted at your job, you're gonna be more accountable for more things. Whether you're doing it or not, you're accountable for what happens to right. you, what, what your coworkers do or the people that's below you do. That's you know believe if they paying you more money, they expect you to do more. With respect comes responsibility. So God. check this out. Numbers 28 and verse 7. This is the book of Numbers chapter 28 and verse 7. This is an example, right? And the drink offering thereof shall be the fourth part of a hen. So he's giving you an example. This is an example of how offerings were done in the Old Testament, right? There was a drink offering. Right. Let's keep reading for for the one lamb in the holy place. Shalt thou cause the strong wine to be proud poured unto the Lord for a drink offering. Right. So there was there was also a um, there was a food offering and there was a drink offering. Right. And it, it said what wine. And there was also a lamb. That lamb was the meat offering. Right. So during Passover. Right. You're supposed to have a lamb. You're supposed to have wine. And during this Passover, Christ was just using the wine as symbolic of, 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 a, um, of a drink offering. And that was supposed to be his blood purifying for the remission of sins. Right. So we go to John chapter two and verse 10. Right. Because what, what does what also was that wine? What also was that blood? All right, we read about blood and wine a lot in the Bible. All right, so what does it mean? You said John 2 and 10? Yeah. This is the book of John chapter 2 and verse 10. And saith unto him, every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. Right? So it says, it said, every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. Right? Meaning when you go to a wedding... You go to any feast, everybody, that's why a lot of people hate to show up late because they might, there might not be any food left out. You might get the, the bottom, the crumbs of stuff. Everything, 
at the beginning of a feast is, is glorious, right? Everybody's taking pictures of the food and the cakes and the desserts and everything. The best stuff is at the beginning. Then they start bringing the leftovers and the stuff that was held in the refrigerator and stuff like that out later, right? So here at a wedding, this man tasted of this wine. We all heard about how Christ turned water into wine, all right? But you got to understand there's a deeper meaning in the Bible for everything. So check this out. It says he saved the good wine, right, for last, right? Let's read that one more time from Bud. Suck you. Two and ten. Don't you, don't say. You say it started, but right. But thou has kept the good wine until now. He said you kept the good wine until now, meaning the very end of the party, that's when they had the good wine. So what was the good wine? Right? That he saved till later. What was the good wine? And why was the best wine at the end? Right. We see that um, we see that reoccur throughout the whole Bible. The best being saved for last, the best being at the end. We see that it's a reoccurring state. It's a reoccurring. Um, I don't even know the word for it. Um, plot. It's a reoccurring thing in the Bible where the best is saved for last. Right. So let's get some examples of that real quick. Matthew chapter nine and verse 17. This is the book of Matthew chapter nine. And verse 17, before we get examples, this is kind of going more into, um, you, well, we'll just read it. Go ahead. Verse 17, neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break and the wine runneth out and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles and both are preserved. Right. So there again, we were reading about wine. What is this wine? All right. Um, Salakia. All right, so that wine, you know what I'm saying, would be your doctrine. Your wine would be understanding. All right, so also when they was at Passover I and mean, he was passing that blood or that wine around, right, and he was his his body was for meat, right? The bread symbolized his body, right? That bread of life. So guess what he was doing? He was teaching them something new. He was teaching them a new way, a new doctrine. He was giving them information. He's about to pass and he's giving them knowledge for after he passes, right? That's the importance of that, all right? So check this out. Let's get some examples now. Um, Salakia. Salakia. Go to Hebrews 8 and 8. This is the book of Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 8. And it reads, for finding fault with them, he said, behold, the days come, said the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Right. So there goes, you know, what I'm saying that new covenant, right? By blood. Whose blood? We'll find out in a second. All right. This is second Ezra chapter six and nine. For Esau is the end of the world and Jacob is the beginning of it that followeth. Once again, we see again what that the end is going to be what the better. The end is the better wine, just like in just like in the wedding when he turned water into wine and the man said, you've saved the best for last. We see that reoccur in the Bible all the time. Right. So get Genesis 25 and 26. This is a book of Genesis, chapter 25 and verse said 26. Right. And after that came his brother out and his hand took hold on Esau's heel and his name was called Jacob and Isaac was three score years old when the she and when, when she bare them. Right. So guess what? This is just adding to what we just read. Right. Esau is the beginning of the world. Wait, no. Esau is the end of the world. Jacob is the beginning of it that followed. So when he came out grabbing onto that heel, what was the purpose of him grabbing onto that heel? We cled, we were cleaving onto these other things in the world, but guess what? In the new world to come, they'll be cleaving on to us, all right? We see this, once again, like I said, reoccurring. A lot of times in the Bible, it said that firstborn was supposed to be dedicated to the Most High, but we see through faith and through promises, it was kind of the opposite because as we read about, um, as we read about Isaac, Isaac wasn't Abraham's firstborn, right? 
As we read about Jacob, he wasn't the firstborn. When we read about Joseph, when Joseph was so loved by his, um, um, when so Joseph was so beloved, loved by his, like, uh, his dad, right? Joseph wasn't the firstborn, right? Reuben's the firstborn. But who, whoever hears about Reuben like that in the Bible, right? So what I'm saying is not all the time is that firstborn or that first thing always the better in every case. So moving on, right? <clears throat> Let's get to the point. Matthew 27 and 25. This is Matthew chapter 27 and verse 25, right? And it reads, then answered all the people and said, his blood be on us and our children and on our children, right? Read that one more time. Then answered all the people and said, his blood be on us and all our children. Read that. Then answered all the people and said, his blood be on us and on our children. Right. You got to read that right, man. You what know, they, you said on all on you. You messed it up a few times. I did. He did. But you know what I'm saying? We got to read it as it's written. You know, they used to kill kings and priests back then. If you, did. you know what I'm saying? The little tiny things. So we got to. Make sure we're very particular. Anyway, Matthew 27 and 25, the people after they crucified Christ or before they crucified Christ were saying, hey, look, the blood be on us, right? And they were pretty much saying, hey, look, we're sure of our decision. If it's wrong, let his blood be on us. But this is the twist that I'm going to put on it, right? Because when we're in the Christian church, we grow up in the Christian church, people always say, uh, plead the blood. I plead the blood. Uh Please pray that God's blood covers us. You know what I'm saying? But we didn't know what we was doing back then when we were saying his blood be on us and our children. We thought we was getting rid of a heretic. We thought we was getting rid of a madman. We thought we was getting rid of, um, of somebody that was crazy. All right. So they said his blood be on us and all our children. You had something? Just a quick precept. Go ahead. Uh, this is John um, 11. In verse number 50, uh, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. Verse 51, and this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus Christ, Hamashiach, Yahushai, should die for that nation. Right. So guess what? Even though they killed him and they said his blood be on our hands, guess what? There was a deeper play in action. There was a deeper plan in action, right? So let's go to 2 Samuel 24 and 10. This is the book of 2 Samuel chapter 24 and verse number 10. It's like you. No, don't go to verse 10. Go to verse 1 first. Verse 1. And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to and say, he what? And he moved David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. Right? Go number Israel and Judah. He moved the who? Read that from the top. <clears throat> and again, the anger of the Lord was kindled. The anger of the Lord. So the Most High is mad right now. Keep reading. Kindled against Israel and he moved David against. So them. when the Most High was mad, he moved David against the people. Was that a good thing or a bad thing? It's judgment. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? We're going to find out. Let's go to verse 10. Verse 10. And David's heart smote him after that he had numbered the people. After what? After that he had numbered the people. Right. So the Most High in, in his anger moved David to do something. And David felt bad for doing it. Why? Keep reading. And David said unto the Lord, I have sinned greatly. I have what? I have sinned greatly. So the Most High moved David to what? Sin. To number the people. Keep reading. And that I have done. And now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of the servant. For I have done very foolishly. Right? So this is a, this is a mirror image, right, of what happened to us. When we crucified Christ on that cross and we said, let the blood be on us. Right. The most high moved us to do that. The most high moved us to crucify our savior because it was a bigger plan. And guess what? We're supposed to come like in first Kings eight. We're supposed to come right after we've been moved to sin. 
Just like David was moved to sin by the Most High, because and look, he kills and makes alive, right? He creates evil, he creates light. So guess what? We was moved to sin and kill our Messiah. Now we have to be like David. David said, and David said unto the Lord, I have sinned greatly and that I've done. We're now confessing our sins of our ancestors and of us, right? Of what we did. And what else did David say? And now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant. We're asking him to forgive us and take away our iniquities. But he already knew from the end, from the beginning. He knew that he was going to take away our iniquities before we even had the iniquity, right? But he put it in our mouth when we said, guess what? His blood be on us and our children. We didn't know that we were saving ourselves by saying that. To the, to the naked eye, it sounds like we're condemning ourselves, right? But here we see that the Most High moved David to sin. And David had to be asked for forgiveness of that sin, even though the Most High moved him to that sin, right? Let's, keep, let's get another example. 1 Samuel 18, right? 1 Samuel 18 and 10. This is the book of 1 Samuel chapter 18. Come on, man. You got to be quicker than and this. And verse... I mean, I didn't get, I mean, I, I think I'm. Go ahead, quick, go ahead. You know what I'm saying? Go I ahead. Get a rap sheet. Go ahead. You said 1 Samuel what? 18 and 10. 18 and verse 10. And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul and he prophesied. Uh, in the what midst. spirit from God? The evil spirit from God. The evil spirit from who? From God. The evil spirit from God. Came upon Saul and he prophesied. And he prophesied in the midst of the house. And David played with his hands as at other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand. Right. So go back up, right? We're gonna dissect this. It says that an evil spirit from God, right? Read from there. That the evil spirit from God from God, <clears throat> not from anybody, not from Satan, not from a devil, not from the enemy. But from God, an evil spirit from God, keep reading, came upon Saul. Came upon Saul. And he prophesied in the midst of the house. And he prophesied. We prophesied. When that evil spirit came upon us to put Christ on the cross, we prophesied and we didn't even know it. We said, let the blood be on our hands. Because why? We read it earlier in Hebrews. Because without blood, there's no remission of sins. If we didn't say that, if Christ wasn't crucified and his blood wasn't on us as a people, Guess what? We wouldn't have remission of sins. So last one I'm going to get is Proverbs 20 and 24. This is the book of Proverbs chapter 20 and verse number 24. And it reads, man's goings are of the Lord. Man's goings. What does that mean? Man's goings. What does that mean? A man... And his whereabouts, a man and what he says, what he does, what's going to happen to him, where he's going to in life. Man's goings, right? Future tense, whatever he does, whatever's going to happen to him, wherever he goes, man's goings is of the Lord. So that's why we read that, that God moved David to sin. That's why we read that God sent the spirit to, to Paul, I mean to Saul, an evil spirit to Saul. That's why we read that we put Christ on that cross. Right. But keep reading. How can a man then understand his own way? We didn't know what we was doing. David did not know that he was going to number the people. He didn't know that he was going to sin against God. Right. Saul didn't know he was going to sin and prophesy lies. Right. We didn't know he was going to put Christ on that cross. But guess what? Man's goings are of the Lord. It's a deeper plan behind everything. And that's why we have to understand that God orchestrates everything. Stuff that we think is bad. Guess what? On the surface level, it might be bad, but deeper, there was a plot, right? There's a there's a beginning, right? An interlude, right? You got your um, rising climax. You have your climax, your closing climax, and you have the end, right? We're not at the end yet. It's, it's soon approaching, but everything was written and everything was played out in the shadows of this world for the world to come. So with that, I'm going to say Shalom. I hope you guys have a peaceful Sabbath.